All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we are uh, we have the return of Dr. Balakrishnan uh, to give us a lecture for the C4 series. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan completed his medical school at Rush Medical College before joining us here at SUNY Downstate, Kings County, where he completed the combined EMIM residency program, uh, where he also served as EMIM chief during his final year. Uh, after staying on for a year here, he completed a two-year critical care fellowship at Albert Einstein and now works as an intensivist at St. Joseph's University Medical Center. Uh, in his free time, he enjoys watching Star Wars movies with his son and daughter, cooking steaks on his outdoor grill, and torturing residents and fellows with complex mixed acid-based problems. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So this is my topic, chest compressions and CPR. It's something I got really interested in during fellowship. I have no conflicts of interest uh, for the purposes of my student loans. I kind of wish I did, but um, my objectives are, um, we'll go into some epidemiological background surrounding cardiac arrest. And then for the bulk of the presentation, I'm gonna do a deep dive into the science behind chest compressions. And then briefly, we'll go over a potential future direction with CPR. One thing to note with uh, CPR and a lot of the evidence for it, there's been a lot more studies on the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest realm than there have been with the in-hospital cardiac arrest realm. So many of the recommendations for IHCA management have been extrapolated from the studies from OHCA. So why does this matter? Um, this review of the Get With The Guidelines registry from a few years back uh, looked at the incidence of both adult and pediatric in-hospital cardiac arrests and found that the incidence of adult in-hospital cardiac arrest is increasing. Um, and this review was performed in 2019, so it doesn't capture the dramatic increase that we experienced during the COVID surge. Um, for those of you who don't know, get with the guidelines. It's a registry, um, a national perspective, in-hospital cardiac arrest registry. It's sponsored by the AHA. This is another review to get with the guidelines registry. It was from the years 2015 to 2019, and it looked at disability adjusted life years um, that were lost attributable to in-hospital cardiac arrest. And they noted that it's been generally rising during the years studied um, for some context, uh, disability adjusted life years. Um, they're calculated as a sum of years lost of life lost to disability and the years of life lost due to premature mortality. It's a way to quantify overall morbidity and mortality of a population. When compared with other reported causes of death, uh, in-hospital cardiac arrest was found to be the 11th most co uh, highest contributor to DALYs in the US, and when combined with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the second highest. Uh, one limitation of this particular calculation is it requires some sort of quantification for disability. So arrests that did not have some sort of documented disability score, like a cerebral performance category or a modified Rankin scale, were excluded from the analysis. So with that in mind, we're probably undercounting the number of disability adjusted lost years. Um, and for the junior residents, uh, this is what the modified Rankin scale is. It's a way to quantify a uh, disability. Um, the way I think about it is less than or equal to three means that you can perform your um, acti activities of daily living, um, but you may require some assistance with um, independent activities of daily living. And then greater than three, um, you're not able to even perform your um, IADLs. So the most recent complete guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiovascular care are pretty explicit in the importance of prompt CPR and chest compressions. And this emphasis on chest compressions has been consistent since 2010 when the ABC airway breathing circulation model was reorganized into the CAB circulation, then airway, then breathing paradigm. While direct cardiac massage on humans had been performed in the operating room starting in the 18th century, and more commonly with the advent of thoracic surgery in the 1900s, closed compressions to resuscitate humans didn't come into the fore until um, this case report um, was published in 1960, uh, involving 20 patients ranging from 20 months to 80 years who had suffered a cardiac arrest. Uh, 13 of the patients received intermittent artificial ventilation um, while receiving six, uh, 60 compressions per minute. 
Three of them were found to be in ventricular fibrillation and defibrillated, and all of them had ROSC, and 14 of them actually survived to discharge. It's important to think of chest compressions as having two phases. There's the compression phase, um, which simulates systole, and the decompression phase, which simulates diastole. Uh, closed chest compressions, they increase the pressure throughout the thoracic cavity, so it squeezes blood out of the heart, the lungs, the great vessels, and then venous pressures are mitigated by a closure of venous valves at the thoracic outlet. So that's how you maintain the um, gradient that facilitates end organ perfusion. And then when during decompression, um, the recoiling thoracic cage, it creates a vacuum. So blood gets drawn back into the heart, the lungs, and the great vessels. And then if you're assuming that there's no aortic insufficiency, the aortic valve closes and there's a gradient that develops between the aorta, aorta and the right atrium. And so the coronaries get perfused. So this gradient is also referred to as the coronary perfusion pressure or CPP. A little over 30 years ago, in response to animal studies that had suggested a positive correlation between increased CPP and ROSC and survival, Manny Rivers, who is famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, for his studies on fluids and sepsis, he and his colleagues investigated whether it had an impact for humans. So their study, um, they included 100 patients. They underwent invasive aortic and right atrial pressure monitoring during CPR. The placement of right atrial and aortic cath catheters was stated as part of the standard cardiac arrest therapy in their department at that time, which seems pretty intense, but they found that a maximal coronary perfusion pressure of less than 15 was associated with death, and the mean coronary perfusion pressure of patients who survived was 25.6. So the take-home is increasing coronary perfusion pressure it correlates with increased probability of ROS. So what about the rate of compressions? Um, in concordance with that study, the initial one on closed um, chest compressions, the initial CPR guidelines, which were made in 1966, they recommended a compression rate of 60 times per minute after ensuring that the airway was patent and that rescue breaths were being uh, provided. So A, then B, and then C. In the 80s, there was a study involving canine subjects. Um, they noted higher coronary perfusion pressures, mean arterial pressures, and survival rates among those randomized to a compression rate of 120 versus 60 after an induced V-fib arrest. And then more recently, there was a review looking at approximately 3,100 patients suffering an out-of-hospital arrest between December 20, uh, 2005 and May 2007 in the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium Registry. And this is a network of 11 regional clinical centers and a data coordinating center that conduct research of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and trauma. They found a significant association with ROSC that peaked at a compression rate of approximately 125 per minute and then declined precipitously as the rate increased. Of note, there was no association with survival to hospital discharge and the decline in ROSC as the rate of compressions increases, you can think about it as you have less diastolic filling time, right, the decompression phase. So less diastolic filling time means less blood going in during diastole, means less going out during systole. And then looking at compression depth, um, this observational study from 2014, um, there are more than 9,000 patients, so from the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium Registry. They found the highest survival rate um, at depths between 40 and 54 millimeters, and this translates to between one and a half and two inches. They also noted that compression depth also decreased as the rate increased, which might be another explanation for why ROSC goes down as compression rates go up. More recently, um, there was a secondary analysis of a trial that originally evaluated the use of impedance threshold devices in CPR for out-of-hospital arrest. So the intervention group, they called that active ITD, and the control group was sham ITD. And the EMS agencies, um, they'd also been using defibrillators um, that collected data on chest compression rate and depth. And they calculated the optimal combination of compression rate and depth associated with the maximal probability of survival with a modified ranking score of three or less at time of discharge. So 
survival with favorable neurologic status. And the compression depth in this analysis was 47 millimeters, which is slightly under two inches. And the optimal compression rate was 107 times per minute. It's also important to minimize interruptions to compressions. Um, studies in animal models, they demonstrate decreased coronary perfusion pressures in subjects who receive chest compressions and rescue breathing compared with those who receive chest compressions only. And coronary perfusion pressures rapidly decrease with pauses to chest compressions. So this proportion of time um, during CPR spent providing chest compressions, they call that the chest compression fraction or CCF. Um, Further reviews of the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium Registry found a link between CCF and survival in patients with B fib arrests on the left and um, pre-hospital loss in patients with non b fib arrests on the right um, for the patient in whom the chest compression faction was measured. Both of these groups were out of hospital arrests. So take home points. Um, the data here is either from retrospective analyses or from animal models, but in general, ROSC rates are correlated with increased perfusion pressures, uh, coronary perfusion pressures, uh, chest compression rates between 100 and 125, that's a typo, depth between 40 and 54 millimeters, and an increased chest compression faction. This is one of the reasons why I think you should be real careful with using ultrasound during CPR, because it can take time away from actually providing CPR, um, because doing ultrasound while people are doing chest compressions, it's incredibly hard. Um, so really focusing your attention on providing high quality CPR, you're going to get better outcomes. Um, so that's a compression po component. What about decompression? So this study, they use pigs. Uh, subjects receive three minutes of chest compressions with 100% recoil one minute of compressions with only 75% recoil, and then another minute of compressions with full recoil. So they did 100 for three minutes, then 75 for one minute, and then 100 for um, one minute. And there was more than 25% decrease in coronary perfusion pressure and an over 50% decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure during the period with 75% decompression and partial recovery in the second period where you had full decompression. So if you guys don't remember, um, cerebral perfusion pressure, that's your MAP minus your ICP. In humans, though, um, the evidence has been mixed. Uh, one study looked at a little over 1,100 patients. They suffered from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest within two regions in Ontario over a two-year period, and they didn't find any significant association between the chest compression release velocity and improved rates of ROSC or neurologically intact survival which they defined as a modified Rankin score of less than three. Um, these metrics were abstracted from accelerometer uh, measurements um, taken during CPR, so from the defibrillators themselves. This is another study um, looking at approximately a thousand um, out of hospital um, arrest resuscitations by two agencies in Arizona over five years. And they did find an association between compression release velocity and probability of survival. Um, this is a pretty busy figure, um, but going through it, the authors looked at each individual arrest. Um, they calculated the predicted probability for survival based on their risk factor pro profile, and they controlled for possible confounders. Um, the solid line that you see in the middle there, it's the probability of survival for values of compression release velocity calculated from their logistic regression model. The dashed lines are the 95% confidence intervals, the X values are patients who died, and the hollow circles are the patients who survived. As such, um, the recommendations, given that the evidence in humans is mixed, the recommendations are conditional and not explicit. What about monitoring um, our CPR quality? So what are the two most commonly used modalities we have? There's end tidal CO2. And then some of the zoles that you have will say good compressions, increased depth, push harder. Um, so audio feedback from the zole. So this is a propensity matched observational study from the Get With The Guidelines Registry. They looked at adult CPR events and that found that some sort of monitoring, either 
end tidal or diastolic blood pressure um, by an arterial line was associated with increased rates of ROSC, um, although survival to hospital discharge and survival with a favorable neurologic outcome were the same between two, both the groups. Then a little bit about end tidal CO2. We generally use it as a surrogate for coronary perfusion pressure and overall cardiac output. Um, and the way you think about it is if you're perfusing your organs, um, you're going to generate CO2 and then you're going to be able to detect it um, on respiration um, when you're ventilating a patient. So if you're not metabolizing at all, you're not going to generate an end tidal CO2. So this table is from a 2016 uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, they looked at studies evaluating the relationship between end tidal and ROSC. And the only study in their analysis that included serial end tidal CO2 monitoring during a cardiac arrest was a 2001 study by um, Aarons and his colleagues. And they found a strong association between an end tidal CO2 of greater than 20, either initially or after 20 minutes, and ROSC. Uh, greater than 10 was also associated with ROSC, but not as strongly. An end tidal CO2 of less than 10 after 20 minutes was associated with a 0.5% chance of ROSC. And I definitely got a question on this on my CCM boards um, about using end tidal CO2 uh, measurement okay. as one of the gauges to discontinue CPR efforts. This is another multi-center study. It looked at the quantitative relationship between end tidal and compression depth and rate. Um, all 538 arrests, both in and out of hospital, were considered for analysis, and exclusion criteria were arrests that were less than two minutes or a lack of data on either end tidal or chest compressions. Um, they averaged end tidal CO2, ventilation rate, compression rate, and compression depth over 15-second epochs, and then process processed the total epochs using mixed effects regression. Uh, they found that each one centimeter increase in compression depth was associated with an increase in end tidal CO2 of 1.4 millimeters uh, mercury. They also noted that increasing the ventilatory rate decreased the end tidal CO2. While the lower end tidal CO2 monitor readings among at higher ventilatory rates may be due to just blowing off more CO2 from ventilation, it could also be from decreased cerebral, um, coronary perfusion pressure because by ventilating them um, so much, you're increasing their intrathoracic pressure and just um, thus decreasing the amount of venous return and thus forward flow. So this swine study looked at mean intrathoracic pressure, right atrial diastolic pressure, and coronary perfusion pressure in three groups of pigs in cardiac arrest at ventilatory rates of 12 per minute, 20 per minute, and 30 per minute. And they demonstrated mean uh, increased um, pressures, um, mean intrathoracic pressures, um, and decreased CPPs as the ventilatory rate increased. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. The evidence for audio feedback devices is a little bit more limited. Um, the evidence review from 2020, ILCOR, which is kind of like an international body that works in conjunction with the AHA in terms of developing guidelines for CPR, they didn't I see- I did decent on my notes today. I only had two. Mm -hmm. I did pretty decent on my notes, I only had two. They didn't see any association between real-time feedback, um, which was either a metronome, um, digital AV feedback with corrective prompts or a tactile clicker for compression depth and release um, and ROSC or survival. It improved CPR quality metrics such as depth, rate, and compression fraction. So as such, the most recent ILCOR guidelines recommend the use of AV feedback devices, but as part of a comprehensive um, quality improvement program. So you use it to help you with your metrics and then thereby you, you assume that the metrics are going to help you um, improve outcomes with CPR. So some take home points, um, real-time feedback um, may be useful. Uh, end tidal CO2 during CPR is associated with ROSC a rapid increase in end tidal CO2 when you're doing CPR may be indicative that you've achieved ROSC, but you should wait until it's time for a pulse check. 
And then it can be affected by compression depth, by respiratory rate, and overventilating patients um, can be harmful as it um, increases the intrathoracic pressure, decrease, decreases venous return, and then thus decreases uh, cardiac output. The evidence for AV feedback models is a little bit more mixed, um, but they improve. They may improve performance in certain metrics, such as rate, depth, and compression fraction, and therefore improve the process. And ultimately, it's the process that matters the most. Um, this survey, um, a few years back, they attempted to identify the practices for resuscitation that were most associated with higher rates of in-hospital arrest survival. So a hospital with more than 20 in-hospital cardiac arrests over a two-year period were included, and the 150 respondents um, were divided into quintiles based on their outcomes. The factors most associated with a higher survival rate for in-hospital arrests were having a regular review of cases, having a resuscitation champion at the hospital, and then having a process to monitor for interruptions for chest compressions. And the more recent AHA guidelines, they have this um, role of a um, compression coach, CPR coach, um, which kind of helps with that. This analysis of index cardiac arrest cases from the Get With The Guidelines registry found that delays in the initiation of chest compressions had an association with decrease in hospital cardiac arrest survival rates. And they're also looking at delays to defibrillation for shockable rhythms and epinephrine for non-shockable rhythms, uh, which you see in the bottom two groups here. And this is, uh, I want you to pay attention to this slide. Um, delays to chest compressions, they can have a really profound impact in the community. So. There are significant racial and ethnic disparities in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival rates. And it's thought that the lower incidence of bystander CPR in Black and Latin American, uh, American communities is one of the contributing factors. So this was a paper in the New England Journal a few years ago. Um, they wanted to see if there was a difference in bystander CPR rates in public and private locations, and if these um, racial and ethnic disparities persisted. So they looked at witness out-of-hospital arrests between 2013 and 2019, and in an effort to focus on layperson bystander CPR, they excluded nursing homes or arrests that EMS providers had witnessed. They looked at also the income composition and the racial and ethnic makeup of the neighborhood in which the arrest occurred. Neighborhoods were categorized as predominantly white, greater than 80%, Majority Black or Hispanic, greater than 50% or integrated. Uh, neighborhoods were also classified by medial, median um, annual household income with greater than $80,000 as a high income, between forty dollars and $80,000 as middle income, and less than $40,000 as low income. And they found that Black or Hispanic patients were substantially less likely to receive bystander CPR, and this difference was worse in public locations than at home. Subsequently, Black and Hispanic patients had lower incidences of survival um, to discharge or favorable neurologic status than white patients. And then while it's true that implicit and explicit bias among laypersons may play a role in the racial and ethnic disparity in bystander CPR, it's also true that CPR training, particularly low-cost CPR training, is less commonly conducted in Black and Hispanic neighborhoods. I mean, for do any CPR, ACLS courses cost anyone? Are they cheap? No, they're not cheap. Um, so this has some pretty significant ramifications for you guys. Brooklyn is experiencing significant demographic changes but the county community remains heavily Afro-Caribbean. And so bystanders, uh, CPR is going to be less likely for victims of cardiac arrest um, while they're waiting for EMS to survive. So educating the community about CPR can have a profound impact. And this popped up on my Instagram feed um, a few months uh, back, and it just makes me really, really proud of you guys um, because this can have a really, really big, big impact. We talk about like having these nice bells and whistles, doing TEE in the emergency department, doing CPR, um, but really 
getting out in the community, encouraging bystander CPR, educating the community, you can have a way, way, way larger impact. Um, so, you know, you should feel proud of this. Moving on, uh, mechanical CPR, um, it's a modality that's been evaluated as an alternative to manual CPR. Um, there are two broad categories of mechanical modalities. There's a load distributing band that compresses the thorax circum uh, circumferentially, like the Zola auto pulse, which you see on the right-hand side. And then there's pneumatic piston devices like the Lucas on the left, um, which compress the chest in the anterior posterior direction. There's been four major randomized control trials um, looking at um, manual CPR and these mechanical um, devices. Um, two of them looked at the load distributing band and manual CPR, and then two of them looked at the piston and manual CPR. <clears throat> so the first one, um, this is the ASPIRE trial. Um, it's a multi-center cluster randomized trial that evaluated approximately 800 patients um, without a hospital arrest that they presumed was from a cardiac origin. So um, ischemia, VTAC, VFib prior to EMS arrival. And they compared the Zoll autopulse, so this is a circumferential device, to manual CPR. So there were three options for CPR, six seconds of a rhythm check followed by either manual or mechanical CPR, immediate manual CPR regardless of randomization until the first shock assessment, or analysis with shock if indicated prior to CPR. One of the sites changed from the first to the second option after their quality improvement program noted delays in the initiation of compressions while deploying the autopulse device. And they terminated study enrollment um, prematurely because of safety concerns, but there were similar um, survival rates and they actually found worse neurologic survival associated with the use of the autopulse. And this trial, the CERC trial, um, they looked also at the load distributing band and CPR. So it's 4,300 patients, multi-center. Um, adult patients with out-of-hospital arrest presumed to be a cardiac origin. And they randomized the patients after EMS had started manual CPR. Uh, the primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge. And the secondary outcomes were survival to 24 hours, sustained ROS, and neurologic status on discharge. They didn't find any statistically significant difference uh, between the two interventions with respect to survival to hospital discharge or the rate of functional neurologic status on discharge. And then moving on to the Lucas. So this is the paramedic trial. Um, it was in the United Kingdom, uh, about 4,500 patients in the UK, um, multi-center cluster RCT. And these were adults suffering from a non-traumatic out-of-hospital arrest if the trial EMS vehicle was the first ambulance vehicle on the scene. The patients got either manual CPR or CPR from the Lucas, and randomization occurred at the level of the EMS vehicle. Patients in the Lucas group uh, received manual CPR until the Lucas got powered up. They paused CPR to place the Lucas and then restarted it as a until the central arms were positioned and locked in place, and then they activated the Lucas when they had activated the suction cup. Uh, the control C uh, group just got manual CPR. Um, because they had a limited number of devices, the randomization occurred in a one to two ratio, and they still found no significant difference between the two, respect, uh, two groups um, with respect to primary outcome, but the Lucas group trended towards worse survival with good neurologic status. And then finally, this is the LINK trial, um, which is a multi-center RCT, uh, 2,600 patients with non-traumatic out-of-hospital arrest in Europe. All the patients got manual CPR until randomization occurred. And if they were randomized to the Lucas group, they got manual compressions until the device was deployed. Then defibrillation, without even pausing for a rhythm check, occurred at 90 seconds. First rhythm check occurred at three minutes, at which point defibrillation was delivered if it was indicated. And the patients who got manual CPR were traded um, as per the 2000 guidelines. Their primary outcome was four-hour survival after ROSC, and then the secondary outcomes were survival with a pulse to the ED, survival to discharge from the ICU with good neurologic outcome, which they define as a CPC of less than two, um, survival to hospital to discharge with a good neurologic outcome, one month and six month survivals with good neurologic income uh, outcome. As you can see, um, there was no significant difference between the two groups for any of the outcome. Um, except for an increased number of patients who arrived from the ICU with a CPC of one. So 
so consequently in 2018, um, Cochrane review um, that included 11 studies, they didn't find any difference between mechanical devices and manual CPR in survival to hospital discharge. Although the um, evidence did trend towards increased rates of ROSC and decreased rates of good neurologic function. Um, as such, um, there's a conditional recommendation regarding their use only in situations where manual CPR may be challenging or dangerous. Um, and for my part, um, during my residency, I can't remember many cases where we use the Lucas. Really, I can just think of hypothermic arrests, and that's because they're so long. Um, otherwise, it was just manual CPR. So a potential future development is something called heads-up CPR, um, and it involves elevating the patient's head and thorax while they're receiving mechanical compressions. And the hypothesis is it allows cerebral venous drainage, which decreases the ICP, um, and also increases this um, uh, uh, coronary perfusion pressure. And this may, um, sorry, cerebral perfusion pressure, which may improve uh, neurologic outcomes. It's had promising results in animals. Um, there was a study published a couple of years ago looking at heads up CPR in the pre hospital setting. They reported improved rates of ROSC, survival to discharge, and favorable neurologic outcome. But four of the initial 10 EMS systems had their patients excluded from analysis as they were in the early implementation phase, and the results were compared to historical control. And the reported time windows um, where there was a benefit were different from the pre established primary outcome. Um, so really need more information. There are also new defibrillation devices that filter out compression artifacts and allow for um, you to see if there's an organized rhythm developing, which could potentially decrease um, the length of peri-defibrillation pauses. Um, I've heard an example of a hospital in California where they actually use end tidal CO2 and rhythm analysis to determine whether to stop compressions, um, but more data is needed. Ultimately, the priority is on delivering high quality CPR with early defibrillation if indicated. And I wanna close with this illustration from 1974's AHA guidelines to demonstrate how far we come uh, in the past hundred years with respect to our knowledge of how to treat cardiac arrest. And these are like some historical practices. So like you see in the bottom, um, or, uh, people being hung, um, hung upside down. So maybe that increases venous return or on the um, being rolled on the barrel also like simulates compressions. So we've, we've come a long way. And we must be doing something right because our survival rates are improving. So my take home points, um, high quality CPR, it involves optimizing compression rate and depth um, to optimize cardiac output and thus end organ perfusion, venous return and coronary perfusion. Real-time feedback, um, they may be helpful, these devices. Um, we don't have conclusive evidence for mechanical CPR devices. And then there are significant racial disparities with respect to bystander CPR. All right, questions? Dr. Franch. I was just going to make a point about uh, defibrillation in, in hospital cardiac arrest. This was a, was a neat way in the journal article a few years back showing that the time to first delivery of shock was seven to eight minutes. And in hospital cardiac arrest, a lot of times you go in there and you know, people are doing this and this, but still, uh, CPR is king, but you got to get the heart. It's like you get taught time equals brain and stroke and cardiac arrest time equals everything. Um, and the two most important people in a cardiac arrest are the person delivering compressions and the person putting the pads on because that's your first branch point. Once, as soon as you know, shock or non shockable, you shock them immediately if you can. Does anybody know uh, for the average shock for EMS to get to the patient case and cycle with them? I mean, there was a study about a hospital cardiac arrest in London mm -hmm. that was said to be I would find it hard to believe that that's new. You know, it's, I, I would guess it's a lot more in central Brooklyn, um, but I haven't seen anything published. 
how to compare to the other places in the country and the world in terms of rural uh, response time here? How to well, it varies because like some countries, Southeast Asia, they have um, really decentralized notification. So you'll have like Uber drivers will have defibrillators in their car. And if there's a cardiac arrest, they get notified about it um, on just some app and they, the closest one responds, they might be a couple blocks away. Whereas here, um, yeah, you have an increasing frequency of AEDs, but how many people actually know how to use them? Um, Back to your commentary about demystifying CPR and making it more uh, accessible to the bystanders. Yeah. All right. Thanks.